Hi, everybody, and welcome to Friday Night Flock Talk. I'm Robin Sullivan from the Leather Elves, and I'm here with Jack Pine from High Redbird. Hey, Jack, how's it going? Oh, it is. It's hot. I, I, I can't even lie. I can't pretend. It is hot. Um, all this week, we have had a heat index approaching 110 degrees. Um, we are at the time of year where our air is equal parts uh, humidity, flying insect, and misery. So. Happy to be in air conditioned comfort for a live stream. Well, it could be worse. They have um, murder hornets in Seattle or in Washington State. So, I mean, come on. I'm just trying to keep things positive here on Flood Talk. I'm, I don't believe that they are murder hornets. I don't know if they have that in them. Maybe like, you know, second degree battery. Like, I don't know. Maybe they get road rage, but I don't know if they're going to commit murder. That's true. Good point. Well, we'll have to keep an eye on that and we'll keep you guys up to date. So, and maybe you should keep a record of it because tonight's topic is record keeping for animal caregivers. Did you, that was pretty smooth. Did you see that? That was a smooth was segue. It was, I know. So, but before we get started, Jack, do you have any announcements? No, we have a couple of announcements. Uh, a lot of these are going to be the same announcements we have. And if you haven't, done the things yet um we're gonna keep asking you to so uh the first one we're gonna ask you guys to go ahead and like the leather elves page on facebook now don't forget we do these live streams every single friday at 7 p.m eastern but if you like the leather elves page on facebook you will get a notification whenever we start a live stream that way you don't miss out in the event that you do miss out if you're working late or something happens that you're busy you can always watch these videos at a later date. They will all be in a playlist on the High Redbird YouTube channel. So you can go subscribe to that. That way you never miss out on any of the fun information. Um, and of course, you know, if you're on Instagram, you can like both the Leather Elves and High Redbird on Instagram. Um, we post a lot of fun things. We, we post things that are a little bit different. I post primarily baby animals. Uh, Robin posts a lot of photos of animals interacting with toys and different enrichment. So whatever animal fix you need in your life between the two of us, I am sure we can provide it. Um, and we are, you know, constantly working on new fun and exciting things. Uh, I think for us, the next exciting thing coming down the pipeline is Robin and I will be speaking at the AFA conference in August. Um, we'll actually be doing individual sessions we'll be doing a workshop together and that will be where we will have our first live live stream so if you would like to hang out with us in person and who wouldn't uh you can make sure make plans to come to the afa conference uh you can visit www.afabirds.org uh i am reasonably certain that is the correct website uh, <laughs> okay it's been a long day and i'm hot so I, I don't know. I might have made it up. Um, but no, if you go to www.afabirds.org, you'll get information about the conference. You'll get to see more information from us. And that could be your chance to hang out with us in person. But I know we have a really fun topic that we want to dive into tonight. We do. There's one thing I want to say first before we get started, Jack. Um, one of our regulars here on um, Friday Night Flock Talks, posted on Facebook that she was headed to the ER. So we want to um, wish Pat Anderson all the best um, and hope that, you know, it's just a quick visit in and out and uh, that she's feeling better. So um, shout out to Patricia and and hoping that she's, she's doing okay. So um, I bet she's probably having to give over a lot of medical records. Yeah. Was that a decent segue on that one? No. That anyway. One but it was a little, a little rough, but, um, so medical records, you know, we all think about it. Oh, I've got, you know, they keep them at the vets. They they've got, them. Um, I just call them and they tell me what I need to know. And I think we have found, I think that good records makes animal care significantly easier. And do you agree? Yeah, you need to keep uh, appropriate medical records. Uh, knowing this information about your animals, it's going to help you provide uh, 
immediate care. It's going to help you know what you need to worry about, what things are going to be coming up. Um, obviously, as animals hit certain ages, uh, just like with us, as we hit certain ages, there are additional concerns or new concerns that you have to worry about. So knowing your animal's history, knowing its age, knowing as many factors of its medical history as you can are going to help you to provide the best possible quality of life for your animal. Definitely. And I think too, you know, we talk a lot about record keeping um, in, in the industry and it's really, I mean, you got to get started right out of the gate. You know, people who have rescue birds, you may not have that history. You may not have those records um, that, you know, some of us who have had birds from, from very young ages, you get to keep it all the way through, but either way, you've got to start doing it. It's, it's one of those things that, you know, Jack and I do the, the politically correct, we would suggest, and it might be a good idea if you, but on this one, I think this is one of the ones that we need to say, you got to do this. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously the more information you can have on your animal, the more history, the better. Um, but if you did not start taking those records and keeping those records from the very first day that you got your animal, um, you are in luck because, you know, the best time to start with your records is when you get that animal. But the second best time is right now. Um, start today. Um, and hopefully with some of the things that Robin and I are going to tell you, we're going to give you some suggestions on what sort of information to pay attention to, what sort of things to monitor so that you know, does your animal perhaps need to see a vet? Is there something you should be concerned about? And medical records help you analyze and uh, recognize patterns with your animal. Mm -hmm. So when you have those records available, you can see is something scary or is it, you know, is there a recurring, you know, slight weight drop this time of year, every single year? Um, you know, if you have those records, you can know. And I think too, you know, a lot of times we'll, you start out all gung ho, you get the new bird or you, you know, you adopt a bird and you're like, okay, I'm going to do this right. I'm going to, you know, keep everything. And, and then all of a sudden you've got this junk drawer filled with, um, with information, but you really don't know what that information is. And so if you, you've got to analyze and assess that, that information that you collect, because if you don't, it's just, it's just a, an exercise that you're doing because you were told that you should do it. And, you know, if you, you've got to take a look at it. And sometimes these kind of records and this kind of data help us be a little bit more objective about our care. So if you've got a bird and you're like, oh no, he's, he's fine. He's just a little chubby. Well, just a little chubby can be a death sentence for some birds. You know, and if you keep those good records and you look at them, and you go, wow, this, you know, he's put on some weight or or, you know, he's this is how this this enrichment's being, you know, acted with inter interacted with those kind of things. But you've got to take a look at what you're collecting, not just collect it. Yeah, I completely agree. I would say no matter what kind of records you're keeping, whether it's medical records, which is what we're going to be talking about first, or later on in the session, we're going to be talking about enrichment records. Um, mm -hmm. Any records that you're keeping with your animal, if you're not assessing them, if you're not understanding what that information means and trying to extrapolate how you are providing your care for that animal based on those records, um, I'd say you're not getting the full value out of them. That's got to be the most important component of your records, better understanding your animals. It's, it's kind of that, so it's, it's part of that journey, that pathway that we talk about in, you know, making sure we're providing really good animal welfare. If we're keeping these records and we're looking at them and we're analyzing them to, again, to stop at that point is, is kind of futile because it's, why did I go through the effort of collecting this information and then analyzing this information? And now I'm just, the, oh, oh, okay. So now I know what I see and what the, data says, well, what are you going to do with that data? How are you going to use that and make it make you a better animal caregiver? I mean, I think that's the whole, the whole point of it. So, um, so a general record, what do you think? I mean, name, 
What else? So I like to start with identifying features for my bird. Um, so one, make it easy. If I want to submit my records to a vet, they can have any identifying information they need on that animal. Um, if I ever lose my animal, the very first page also tells me everything I might need to know if somebody else finds it. So things like name, uh, photos of the bird. I like to start with at least one good photo of the bird. Um, and by a good photo of the bird, I, I, you know, we all have that photo where the bird is, you know, oh, I'm playing with enrichment and I'm like halfway into a box. And that's a great photo to post to like your social media, to share with your friends. But to have a photo for a record, I usually like just the bird sitting comfortably, not doing anything crazy so that you can see its overall body. Um, I want to include things like leg bands. Um, if your bird has leg bands, I want to know what they are made of. Are they, with parrots, it's typically going to be metal, but with some of the smaller parrots, you might have plastic leg bands. What is written on those leg bands? And what color are they? Because if you have a bird that has a red metal leg band, that's going to show up differently from a silver metal leg band. You can see that difference if the bird gets out and is 30 feet up in a tree, you can still see that difference in the leg band. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think too, you know, we've got gender on here as well. And when I keep records, one of the things I like to put on as far as gender is concerned is how that was determined. Because sometimes people don't have their birds DNA sexed, but they do the, oh, I can tell by her behavior that it's a female or, oh, I can tell by the way, you know, his, his feathers look, he's a male. Okay, a lot of times that's spot on, but other times it just, you're off. And it, for whatever reason, you know, and it's the, oh, my, my bird's name was, you know, Earl. And I think Karen has an Earl, um, but my bird's name was Earl until she laid an egg and now she's Earl the girl. And so you just kind of have to, I put that on there just so that you know, is this an absolute, well, as absolute as DNA testing can be, um, but is this an absolute, yes, this is a male, yes, this is a female, or is it speculation? Yeah, and I, I think if you go to that behavior aspect, you're getting into a subjective assessment of that animal's gender. And I'm going to be honest, as a professional animal caretaker, I am a big fan of objective measurements. So um, in terms of behavior, there are very few behaviors that I would utilize to say, oh, that's a male or that's a female. Um, if it lays an egg, that's a behavior that I will say, yeah, that's a female. Um, but that's pretty much it. Because um, yeah. so most people know peacocks for picking up their tail feathers for displaying. Um, I have had peahens that will display even though they don't have the same tail feathers. So then you run the question of, is it just an immature male that hasn't grown its long tail feathers yet, but it's still doing these, you know, male behaviors, or is it a female and there's a group of females and they'll do similar things to, you know, jockey for a position. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to tell. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I, these are, so these are the basic things that absolutely need to be there. Um, I also, we do a flock facts, um, that you probably can't see that. Yeah. It's just our Other flock. Way. Wait, there you go. We got it. Our <laughs> flock facts. All it is, is a, is a, um, paper binder. And what a couple of the things that I include as well on that general record is, um, is the bird flighted or not? Um, just because it's good to know if that, you know, this bird gets passed on to someone else. Um, what are some high value reinforcers? Because if you're, you know, if you've got to move quickly, you want to know those things. Uh, is the bird step up train? So I can hand this to just about anyone and they'll have that information on this particular bird. So they know, oh, okay. All right. So this is, you know, this is widget and widget is, got this, 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 and this going on. Um, and don't ever try to take them away from Jack. So yeah, th that's what the notes say. So you've got your basic information. That's your general. To me, the next most important measurement or the next important record that you need to keep is weight. Would you say that? I mean, that to me, that's, 
you know, we've got the information, we've got the general info. What are we going to keep ongoing records on? Weight is the first one that comes to mind. Yeah, I, I would so, say if you're not keeping anything else, weight is, um, it, it's so important because, you know, we have talked about it time and time again. I know many people recognize the fact since birds are prey species, they are designed to hide just about every aspect of illness or injury. They don't want you to know that they're not feeling well because a predator would single that bird out to pick it off. Um, mm -hmm. So birds can hide if they're not feeling well. They can't hide if there's an increase or a decrease in their weight. Because again, it's an objective measurement. No matter how you hold your feathers, you're going to weigh the same. So weight is a great way to assess the well-being of your animal. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you can just do a, a spreadsheet, a straight, just an Excel spreadsheet. If you're going to keep it online, you can do it that way, or you can do the printed version. But either way, I mean, digital, you, you're going to have, you can probably access it wherever you are if you've got a digital version of your records. Um, but you should, you can just, I would keep weight. Um, and then there are a couple other things that we can discuss that I would add. But same time every day. Do you weigh your birds? At, you try to weigh your birds around the same time every day, Jack? Yeah. So if you get that weight at the same time every day, that's going to be the most valuable information because you're getting a direct comparison of those weights. Uh, depending on the bird in question, if you get one weight, you know, right before it is eaten breakfast and one weight, you know, half an hour after it is eaten breakfast, you know, on a macaw, you could be looking at, you know, 20, 30 grams of difference because that crop is full of food that, you know, it wasn't the day before. So does that mean that, uh, you know, do I need to worry? Oh God, my bird's getting so fat. If it's putting on 20 grams a day, you know, in a week, I'm going to have a chicken and not a parrot anymore. Um, but if you're keeping those uh, weights at the same time, you're just going to have a more direct comparison. So yeah, pay attention to has your animal eaten yet? Or is it the same time as when it ate the last time you got a weight? Has it gone to the bathroom yet? Or is it at least relative to the same time it went before? Um, so when we say the same time, I'm not saying you always have to get your weight at, you know, 9.02 a.m., but, you know, just pay attention to how its day and its schedule are going. Absolutely. Um, Laurie makes a really good suggestion there. She has a saved email folder with all her records in it. Um, and she can access that from anywhere. I think that's a great idea, Lori, because it's not like you got to have a flash drive with you or you've got to have the physical papers with you. You can get to that from anywhere that you end up. So that's a good thing. Um, so do we have a video, a weight train? I think we have a weight training video, right? All right. Now, scale training is going to be very, very easy, especially if your bird is already station trained to a particular perch. So all you're going to need is you're going to need your scale. You're going to need your perch. We are going to use this as a stand. Um, so that's going to go right there. And then, Grayson, step down. There you go. We can get a weight on that bird very, very easily. Look at that. It's easy breezy. Thank you, Jack. Um, it's definitely not rocket surgery, um, getting a weight on your bird. Um, if you're old like me, you should have your paper there so that you can write it down um, because I will forget walking into another room um, or going to another location. So you just wanna make sure you write it down. You can even do it um, on a calendar or in your planner, you know, you just jot it down there and then you've got it. It's easy. You're like, oh, I didn't do this yesterday. Or the other thing that, you know, we've talked about before is, so maybe you can't do it every time, every day. Maybe it's, you know, every other day, maybe it's once a week. The more frequently you can do it, the better. Um, but if it's once a week, at least you can note that pattern. You can see that, you know, oh, he's, he's losing a little bit here. It's a little different than it was. I wonder what's going on. So, and I gotta tell you, talking to vets, they love that stuff. If you bring in that weight chart, they're gonna be like, you're the best patient ever. So. Um, yeah, no, They any, any information you can provide on your animal that, shows a vet the long-term history of that animal is going to be valuable information. It's going to be far more important than um, if you didn't have that information. 
Um, and I, I want to point out, so I like to keep records digitally. So I use like the Google Drive. I have different documents that I can do there. Um, when Robin and I are working on these live streams, we can actually have a little bit of contention because I put things there. And Robin's like, okay, no, I need to go write it in my, my physical calendar. Whatever method you have, whatever method you have for keeping your records, if you are able to keep your records that way, that is great. That, that will definitely help you. Um, so like if Robin is not as comfortable keeping those digital records and I tried to force her into that, it's probably not going to be as useful as her paper calendar. Um, same thing for me. I like doing the digital records because I can do them from my phone. If you wanted me to write it all down, oh, good. well, now I got to find a pen. And I, I don't even know if we have paper in our house. So <laughs> I'll send you some. I'll send you a, a ream of paper. But it, it's true. And I think it's whatever you're comfortable with. We've talked about that a thousand times. You know, it doesn't have to be exactly the way we suggest or you know somebody else has told you to do it a certain way if it doesn't work for you you're not going to do it you know it's a matter of i probably would be much less likely to to get regular weights if i had to keep it on a computer just because that's not my preferred record keeping method um i like to have a spreadsheet where i can you know hold it and look at it and the other thing with with the weight, uh, with a weight spreadsheet, or if you're keeping, uh, you know, a chart, you can record other things as well. Um, so some of the things that I think are important, you've got your weight, which is, is really important. Um, and you've looked at it, not you just wrote it down and you went through the motions, but you actually assessed the data that you have. That's even more important than getting the data is that you assess it. Um, and so you assess the weight, you, you look at that feather condition. Do you, how often do you assess feather condition, Jack, when you're looking at a, keeping records on birds? So if I am, if I am observing the birds, we're going to assess their feather condition daily. Um, and if there is a notable change in their feather condition, any notable change in their feather condition, um, is going to be recorded. Cause even if it's just a regular molt, if all of a sudden you just, you know, you know, I think we all have some birds that's like, you're very good at molting. You just drop a few feathers and nobody can ever tell. And then we have the bird that you just come in one morning and it's like, you had a rough night. Like, you've got three feathers left here that are just sticking up at an odd angle. Like, half of your face is naked. You just look rough. You have lightly exploded. Um, if I see a molt like that, I'm going to record it because... You know, is, is that a sign? Was there some stress Was I, when I wasn't looking at the animal? Is there something medically going on with the animal? Or does it just have, you know, bad molts um, or unfortunate molts? And if I then have those records, I can go through and I can look at that. Um, one quick thing on weight I just wanted to point out, because I know Jody was asking, um, the scale that I'm using, what type of scale was it? It's a produce scale, so that scale was actually geared for, um, it can go down to one gram and it can measure up to, I think, 25 kilograms. So one important thing, especially if you have a mixed flock or a mixed collection, when choosing your scale, just choose a scale that can weigh your different birds. And it may be easier for you to have multiple scales. Most scales that you're going to find, they aren't going to be able to do all birds. Um, so the scale that I have at home for my green cheek conure, it can't weigh umbrella cockatoos. It doesn't go up high enough. The, the other thing is when you're getting those weights, make sure you um, fix the tear weight so that if you're using a perch, if it's not the birds just stepping onto the scale platform, because I've had people freak themselves out when it's more than one person that's doing the weighing. And, you know, the person on this day, you know, or, I, you know, I go in, put the bird on the perch. Okay, this is what the weight is. And then the person, the next person comes in, puts the perch up, but doesn't like zero it out after they put the perch on. And then suddenly the bird weighs the bird weight plus the perch. And it's like, <gasps> what's going on? You know, so you've just got to kind of make sure that you remember to do that. The other thing about keeping all these records, I was, as we've been talking, I was thinking about it. It's all 
a, a process that kind of comes together. So I have to get weights and I like to, you know, I'll look at the, I'll assess the data that I have. I'll go over it. It might remind me that I have to get the weight because I've got that sheet or that computer program, whatever it is. But I know, oh, shoot, I missed filling this in, you know, when I should have done it last week. Or it's just kind they do, you know, go hand in hand. And it's kind of a nice reminder that you should be looking at feather condition, looking at weight. The other one that I like to include is uh, foot condition. And I think, you know, because again, that's another indicator of something's going on with your bird. If you, you know, and you can keep your eye on it and it'll remind you to take a look at it. If you're like, okay, I got the weight, I got the feather condition, I got the, the, um, the foot condition. All of it's right there. It can all be in one place. Yeah, and I would say for foot condition, you know, for, for some people you think, oh, I'm, I'm looking to see if my bird's feet are, you know, experiencing poem put that bumblefoot. <laughs> Poto dermatitis. There we go. I can do it. I was now. gonna translate for you. I was gonna be like pododermatitis. Um, you know, if you're looking for those sores or those lesions. But honestly, when assessing foot condition, I'd be looking at a couple of different things. Like how are your bird's feet moving? Are you noticing uh, you know, general swelling? Because especially in some of our older birds, those feet overall can start to swell a little bit, um, just like with people, um, their level of movement. Um, I have a couple of Amazons that have, you know, light degrees of arthritis. So we're constantly paying attention to how much they are moving, how comfortably they are moving. I would consider all of that part of their foot condition. Absolutely. And if you've got that all documented, you're, you're doing really well. Um, and then the other thing is, if you are keeping these kind of records, these medical records, or, you know, and like we're going to talk about enrichment um, logging in a little bit, but if you're keeping these records, if there's something that's just out of the ordinary that you're like, oh, that's just not, you know, this bird's typical, just write it down. It may not mean anything to you today, but as you go back and analyze what you've been, you know, the records you've been keeping, it may help you, it may trigger a thought like, oh, you know, that was a little bit different for him this past week. It, it's just kind of like a spark to help you think, you know, keep your eyes open. And we've discussed yeah, too, you use, you use Delta, Sorry. right? For any kind of change, you use Delta yeah. for any kind of change? No, and there is, there is value. If you are watching your animal and you just think something is off, but there's not something I can put a finger to. Um, if it's like, it's not quite that it's appetite, it's off. It's not that the weight is off. It's not that there's any injury, but something's not right. Um, remember, you are watching your bird all the time. You are going to be the person that is most keyed into changes in your bird. So if you think something has changed, something is different with your bird, there is value in that. So don't don't ever feel like that's not the case. Um, there is actually a very, very fancy medical term um, when keeping animals. Uh, it's uh, ADR, uh, and it means that the animal ain't doing right. Um, that's going to be a term that's used by veterinarians. It's used by zoos, uh, because even in those instances where there are people who have decades of experience working with those animals, there are still going to be instances where there's not something direct we can put a finger on but we know that something is amiss. So we need to just keep an eye on this animal. Yeah, we, I, I've always referred to that as um, jar, just ain't right. Oh. Okay. Um, which is more, I think that's kind of more Texan. I, I would expect something like that from you. Um, oh, no, it doesn't but have anyway. to so you Just ain't, ain't right. It, it's J-A-R, oh, it just ain't right. You have to say right at the end though. All of my Northeastern friends are like, <laughs> No, you don't. So anyway, you want to be able to note those kind of things. Um, and, you know, a lot of times we tell you to simplify, you know, don't have a ton of this, don't have a ton of that. In this case, if you've got more information, you're probably in a better place. You know, it's probably at some point in time going to come in handy for you. If your record, yeah, see, Lori knows she's a northerner, just ain't right. Um, <laughs> but 
you've got it. The more information you have, the better off you're going to be. So is there anything else, Jack, with medical records that you can think of? Um, you know, for me, one of the big things, I've needed to evacuate my annals before. I've had emergencies where I've needed to rush out the door to the veterinarian. Make sure that your records are accessible. If you have mm -hmm. a filing cabinet that you know, oh, the things I need to know on that animal are somewhere in there, that may not help you out. Remember that if you are needing to move quickly, um, it's probably going to be a situation where you are also stressed, which is not going to help your ability to find things. So um, things like Robin showed you guys that folder that has all of that information in one convenient place, that'd be something really easy to grab and go. Um, mm -hmm. If you have multiple birds, you could very easily color coordinate those folders. So without having to go through and read every single one, you could know, I need the red one for this bird and go. So just make sure it's, it's accessible and easy to get to. That's one of the reasons we created the emergency essentials kit, Jack. It's a first aid kit and it comes with this, the, the records folder. And I suggest to people that they hang it by the front door. So that if they're going out, you know, if they're taking their bird out just for a walk or for a ride or, you know, they're just kind of accessing the community, then take the bag with you. It's got what you need. It's got, you know, all the records, all of it's there. Um, you know, Lori, again, scans her records to email. But if you've got those physical, physical, um, you know, folders or books or binders, have them close by so that if you're good and if you've got you know they're in your office and you've got them all stacked up in your office put another copy by the door put a copy in just a tote bag that you can grab and go I and mean, that's to me it's got to be something that's easy to find not something you've got to dig for so well, <laughs> and if me. you've got to dig for it chances are good that you are not keeping up-to-date records. So if it's easier to get to, it's also going to be easier for you to update. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, if you, you should know, you should know where all those things are. Um, but so medical records, super important and even more important than keeping them and having them is assessing them and assessing the data that you have. Uh, that's, it's just, you know, again, we can amass all that information. And if we don't kind of keep an eye on it, then it's, it's a wasted exercise and effort. So that's, I think we've covered medical records. Anything else, Jack, you can think of as far as medical records are concerned? No, I mean, I, I think that's definitely a great starting point. Again, I just want to reiterate if it seems a little bit overwhelming, if it seems like there, there's a lot of things we're asking you to include with your records, start somewhere. Start with, you know, open up a Word document, put your bird's name at the top of it, and just start getting weights once a week. And then start adding and adding to that. And eventually, you'll have a really good system in place. But as long as you get started, you're going to be able to get those records that you really want. Right. And we're working on, we've, we've got an enrichment log and I think we can probably work up, um, you know, just a straight, easy, breezy medical um, log for you guys. And we'll put them up on the Leather Elves uh, page so, or on the leatherelves.net um, so that you can access them and just, you know, make a couple copies for yourself and just get started. It, again, we talk about things, you know, and, and how they can be feel like so much work when you're first starting out, but we want this to be something that is as easy as we can possibly make it because we really feel very strongly that it's a very important thing to do. So enrichment records, um, a little more fun, fun maybe than medical. These are the fun, right, exactly. These are the fun records. These are the records where you get to watch your animals interact with the things that you have offered them or created. So I, I think, you know, I love working at different facilities and, and doing consults at facilities and having the using enrichment um, assessment forms so that, you know, people who don't watch for the details, you kind of have to. Um, but I think the first thing we've got to talk about before we get into assessment 
is a schedule. Not a rigid schedule. We've talked about this before too. Not a rigid schedule. <laughs> right, Jack? Not rigid. So like the medical records, what I'm going to say is whatever schedule you find works for you, if it works with your routine, if you're more likely to use it, it's going to be the more useful tool for you. Um, I have worked with different facilities with different levels of structure to their enrichment. Um, I have worked with uh, places where okay, every Monday we are going to include some form of scent enrichment. Um, and you just know Mondays are scent enrichment. Tuesdays are toy days. Uh, you know, Wednesdays are brows. Um, and, you know, that can be really structured. Um, if you have an animal that you don't think needs that much enrichment because there's already so many other things going on with its environment, maybe you only want to provide special enrichment days certain days a week. Maybe you want to provide two to three forms of enrichment every single day. It's all going to depend on you, your birds, your setup. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, it's, and that's the thing. It comes from observing. It comes from knowing your animals, watching your animals, observing what they're doing and deciding what works for you. I mean, I have, you know, there's one facility out on the West coast that has this wonderful program that one of their keepers created. She was into, you know, data management and she just, it, I mean, all you have to do is kind of push the on button on the computer and it tells you what you should do that day for every animal in the whole zoo. And I was like, whoa, when I first saw it, I was so impressed. And then I'm like, I don't know. I kind of like to have to, to think about that a little bit. You know, maybe not on the days when there's extra work to be done or there's extra training that you want to get in, but having some kind of schedule, you know, we're going to provide this for this bird this many times, you know, just a rough guideline I think is really important. And for me, the other good thing about a schedule is you get to avoid the favorites trap that it's not, you know, oh, he loves this. I'm going to give it to him every single day. And it's like, oh, no, because <laughs> no, because that's not going to work in the long run, you know, and and it's and it's easy sometimes to think, oh, I'm just doing the right thing because my bird loves this, loves it. This is his favorite thing in the whole world. So I'm a great bird mom because I do this. Um, I also want to point out the favorites trap does not necessarily just apply to your bird. Um, I feel like as animal caretakers, we have favorites too. We have things that, oh wait, I can put that together in four seconds, and give it to my bird. And um, I, I don't know if they're going to, you know, they're kind of interested in it. It's not that fireworks response, but I definitely feel good about having enriched that animal but it was really more for you than it was the animal. It was something that you could do quickly, easily, without a strain on your day that alleviates the guilt of needing to provide something for your animal. Um, so if you have that schedule, it, you'll avoid that too. That's true. And the other, the flip side of that is when there's an enrichment opportunity that is ridiculously cute to watch. And you give that over and over again because it's just super cute. Well, if we go back to the, the live streams where we talked about goal-based enrichment and we talked about, um, you know, how, why are you doing these things? Why are you providing these things? That doesn't fit with the because it's cute. There's no because it's cute category. Well, there is, but we, we, we don't want to <laughs> do that all. I mean, let's be honest, there is the because it's cute category, but that's a few and far between. Well, and if, if you guys are a little confused about the idea of enrichment categories, uh, Robin and I did a live stream previously on understanding different categories of enrichment. Um, but basically, it's a way of breaking down your enrichment into different groupings to help you understand what you're providing. So are you wanting to encourage... Um, a tactile response, you know, maybe it's a foot toy, maybe it's something your bird has to touch to interact with. Is it a sound that your bird interacts with? Is it something visual that your bird looks at? If you have 
these categories, it's going to help you follow this method of goal-based enrichment, which is uh, undoubtedly what you should be doing. You should never just give your, an give your animal a piece of enrichment because you think you should be giving enrichment. Like there should be a reason why you are providing that enrichment, a certain behavior, um, a certain response you would like to see from your animal, um, something you think that they could benefit from, that mental stimulation. Um, so definitely think about that. And the categories will help. So if you uh, need more in-depth information on that, we do have a video um, that you guys can watch on that as well. Absolutely. And the we talked too about randomizing using dice. Um, that you can assign different categories a number on the dice and then different opportunities a number and you roll the die and that's that's a, a instead of creating a whole schedule you can just randomize that way and I think that's um, you know that's an easy way to not get stuck yeah and we've done that uh, on do we do that on a live stream we did that on a live stream we did. We talked about using dice to randomize enrichment before um, because I it was fun. It was we, we do it a little bit differently um, in terms of using those dice to randomize enrichment. Because I know you very much like to use the dice to determine your category, determine materials you're going to use. And then you have to come up with um, a fun, new, novel form of enrichment that meets those criteria. Um, and I hate that, uh, <laughs> because most of the time it's 110 degree heat index and I've got to feed all these animals and I've got these ones that need, you know, this basic medical attention and then there's a baby. So I've got a lot of things going on. So one thing I like to do is utilize those dice. I'll assign the categories just like Robin. But then I'll assign subcategories. So it's like if I roll the dice and get browse as a form of enrichment, I roll the dice again, like bamboo. Everybody is getting bamboo today. So those subcategories will directly tell me what I am coming up with. Um, oh, and there is actually a video on the, the High Redbird YouTube channel um, where I demonstrate Robin's technique for this because it is a really cool approach. Um, if you have been stuck, if you've been providing a lot of the exact same things, that's going to be a great option for changing it up, for encouraging you to think of new ways for your birds to interact with things. Um, and I, I like doing it, just not all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we have to randomize what Jack is going to actually do and what he's not going to do. Um, and so that's a perfect example. Jack is not thrilled with that that method of randomizing enrichment. So he's not going to do it that often. Hmm. So we got to think of a different way, which he did. So now he's, he's providing enrichment just in a different way. So a schedule, we'll leave that up to you guys, how you want to handle that. And it can also be if you have, you know, the crazy busy life and, and you're out doing things and, and at work and all that, you can make a list. I'm a huge list person. You can make a list that, Monday, I'm going to do this. Tuesday, I'm going to do this. Wednesday, and plan out your week that way. It doesn't, you don't have to create the schedule from now, you know, to eternity. You just have to create a week's worth and just keep it, keep it basic so that you're not overwhelmed by what you're having to do. So as far as logging enrichment, this is really important again, because you want to keep a record of how your bird interacts or your animal interacts with whatever you're offering. And because if you don't, you could, you know, be like, oh, this is great. This, this works really well. And, and it's, you know, on the bottom of the cage at the end of the day, every time I give it. Okay. So, hmm, I wonder why that is. Is it because the bird just sniffs the top and is done? Is it because, you know, you didn't hang it up right. I mean, you really got to think about what are you looking at? What's really happening? And it's so much fun to create enrichment. I mean, we've done all the DIYs and we've, you know, come up with some really cool stuff. It's fun buying enrichment. Who doesn't love going to the bird market or the bird store or, you know, an event like AFA and going through the vendor hall those are all so much fun. You're like, oh my gosh, my bird's going to love this. I can't wait to take it home. 
but you get it home and then you've got to kind of figure out, did it really work? Or are we back at, this is ridiculously cute. And that's why I bought it. Hmm. So, right. and yeah, um, I, I think paying attention to that information is going to be so important. Again, this all comes back to something Robin and I have told you time and time again, observe your bird, um, enjoy having that, you know, tiny feathered dinosaur in your home because it really is an amazing opportunity for you to, you know, experience things that not everybody else gets to experience. Uh, they're, they're incredible. I think that's one of the things that brings us all together that we love interacting with and watching our birds. So if you observe your bird as they interact with all of these different things, you're making sure that their interactions are safe. You're making sure that, you know, they actually are interacting with certain items. Um, you're learning more about them and they are going to appreciate your interaction with them as well. And, you know, we've talked about, um, we've talked about stress and how stress is, you know, a good thing in some cases, a little bit of stress is okay. And so sometimes even lack of interaction not necessarily just kind of complete, but well, complete avoidance of something you've offered or moving away from something that you've offered. Those kind of things are something that you should be aware of because it's, you know, it's that when you buy that $80 gigantic macaw toy and you put it in there and you're like, oh, okay, this works. This it's It, it was $80, so it's good. Well, maybe it's not. And maybe it's the best enrichment you've ever offered. And the next time you have $80 and you choose to buy some enrichment, that's what you want to spend your money on. So it's not always the same, but it's letting you know what really, really met the goals that you've set for your enrichment. Yeah. And it's not going to be the same for every bird, every bird of the same species. Again, we, I, we do mention this every single week. It really is that study of one. Um, so you need to better understand your bird, know how they interact with things, because uh, I have seen birds of the same species. One loves a toy. One wants nothing to do with it. So when you are providing that enrichment, as you're monitoring them, um, there, there are a couple of things that you're going to want to observe and take note of. And I would say what kind of interaction you're getting. If you're getting that positive or that negative interaction, that's going to be important. Um, and even, I mean, if your bird, I, I think we've all seen it, you put that new toy in and the bird's not terrified of it. It doesn't go running away from it, but you know, feet stay the same place on the perch and the bird just ever so slightly leans away from it. And you can see that it's very clearly watching it. Um, I would say that that is not what I would consider a positive response. But it's not horrible either. It's observing something new. It is definitely getting mental stimulation. Um, so, you know, you need to observe the animal and assess whether or not that is an interaction you're okay with. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I think, so we, we do have an enrichment assessment form. And some of the things that are included are the date, which if you, um, oh, look at that. This magical Nick is making these wonderful things happen. So <laughs> you've got your date. And the reason you put the date on there is because it could be, this is just not something when it's 113 degrees, your bird wants to interact with. Um, if I were here in New Hampshire in the winter, when it's miserable and hard, no, sorry. Um, I probably wouldn't be offering a frozen opportunity. I wouldn't be freezing anything in an icicle or an ice pop before, you know, by choice anyway, it does just happen. Um, but you want to know what the date is that you're offering this and what animal you're offering it to. Cause if you've got a big flock, I know, you know, Shelly was out there a few minutes ago. I'm not sure if she's still with us. Um, but Shelly is probably going, wait a minute. I have, you know, a gajillion cockatoos. Um, oh, so she has an app that keeps all her vet records. So we, we've got Shelly with us and Shelly um, has a lot of different animals living with her. So I like to know which animal it is. And then 
I also like to um, see what category of enrichment you're offering. Is it, you know, and these are my categories that I use. You can you you can call them whatever you want. You know, it's the thingamabobby category, whatever works. Um, and then the time. Go ahead, Jack. Did you have? No. I was, uh, so we had Danny at the the Betts conference this weekend. I, I've talked about this before. Like there are a lot of categories that you can use for your enrichment. So beyond the basic senses that we have here, there's things like environmental enrichment, which can include visual enrichment, audio enrichment, you know, changing out the cage furniture. Training is a form of enrichment, most definitely. Socialization mm -hmm. is a form of enrichment. So utilize categories that are going to apply to what you're wanting to do with your bird. Absolutely. The time presented, you know, I mean, just like, well, you guys don't know this, but I talk to Jack almost every morning. And if he hasn't had coffee or I haven't had coffee, it's not super productive. And so if your bird is like not at its best before it has, you know, its breakfast, or if it's not at its best right before bedtime, and it doesn't interact with something that you've offered, don't write it off. Just look at, oh, what time did I present it? Where is it in the enclosure? So, you know, if this is a bird that you're you're new to offering enrichment to or it's new to your flock and you put something, you know, out in the middle of the room, maybe not. That, that might not work. If you put something at the very back um, for a bird that doesn't, that is always out, are they not going to use it? So you want to know where you're offering it. Um, do you find that makes a difference with your guys, Jack? Yeah. So you're definitely going to see animals interacting with things. If it's in different parts of their enclosure, if it, the smallest change in enrichment can make it a completely different enrichment item. Let me just start by saying okay. that. Um, so if you have something that is the exact same parts, but all these parts are yellow and it's used to getting it when all those parts are green, you know, Birds have great visual acuity. That can make a difference. If there's a different type of food included, that can make a difference. If there's, uh, you know, if you present it at the top of the enclosure versus on the ground, that can make a difference. Um, I'm, I'm, so we've had uh, Daniel Sigmund on here before. Um, he actually came out to the farm uh, to, to watch a lot of the birds that I had. And as I was walking him around, one thing that he was so enamored with was the idea that, of watching birds that were ground foraging because they we would provide different enrichment items. And he's just watching them go to the ground, you know, Quakers and green cheeks and everything, just playing in the leaf litter, finding bits of seed and everything else like that. And the realization that so many of our birds are going to interact in so many different ways. Um, they're going to have their favorites, but... You can also still get birds to do so many different things as well. And you can encourage them to be in different places as well. You know, sometimes enrichment is, we talk about target training all the time that you can move them around with targets, but you can also encourage a bird to utilize more of its space, whether it's in the cage, on the play stand, by where you place different enrichments. So that's something to keep in mind. Then you want to also check what behavior, you want to look at what behavior um, was observed when you presented it. You know, was it the, I need to be at the exact opposite side of the room or the house or, you know, whatever, when you offer this enrichment. And then you want to look at what the level of interaction is. And Jack and I have talked about this too. We do this a little bit differently. For me, a level one is no interaction at all. It's completely avoiding, uh, or it's, it's actually no interaction. There's not not a glance, not a movement, anything. Um, then there's where the animal actively avoids. So that is in itself enriching. Um, it's a little bit of stress when the, you don't wanna use this one all the time, but if an animal actively gets away from something or avoids something, that is a level of interaction. And then briefly interacted, you can determine what briefly means to you. And then sustained interaction. And again, you can determine what sustained means to you. And this this is like the basic form, and then you can personalize it however you'd like to. But you, Jack, you add positive and negative to this this 
area of, of, of the assessment, right? Yeah. So for, for me, the way that I've always done it is I typically rank it on a one to five scale because so many things in animal care are going to be on a one to five scale. Um, body condition is another thing, typically on a one to five scale. Um, although a lot of vets now are doing it on a one to nine scale, which throws me off because I'm trying to figure out where my, what translates to what. Um, but uh, I use a one to five scale and I'll use either positive or negative. So um, for me, a one is minimal interaction. And I say minimal because there are very, very few instances where I have seen an animal have no interaction, no observation of a piece of enrichment at all. If you put it in and, you know, the animal doesn't even pay attention to you, doesn't even uh, go to interact with it, wants nothing to do with it, doesn't even seem to realize it's there, I would, I would classify that as a zero. Um, but the reason I classify it so differently is because... It, it should be rare. Your animal should at least be looking at what you are doing. Um, I mean, that's the point of your enrichment program. So if you're recording it this way and you get a lot of zeros, I would say that that indicates a change that you might need to make in your program. Now, a Absolutely. one is going to be a minimal interaction for me. A five is going to be a maximum interaction for me. So if I use that positive negative, a five a, that's positive is going to be, you know, the animal is playing with this toy for hours, you know, wings flapping, vocalizing, having the time of its life. Um, a five that is negative is the animal is throwing itself to the side of its cage, trying to get away from this terrifying thing that's going to eat it. Um, you know, a positive one is, okay, it has something with a bell. The bird went up, hit the bell once, and okay, I'm done. Well, that, that was anticlimactic, but you weren't scared. You did go to interact with it. So yeah, that's good. That's the one. Um, if your bird does the, I'm watching this, but I'm going to slightly lean away, that might be a negative one. Um, and again, that demonstrates that it's not negative, you know, a negative reaction to enrichment. Um, that little bit of stress is not necessarily a bad thing because it shows that your animal is paying attention to its environment. It's a prey animal. It needs to pay attention to its environment. Um, but as you are logging the enrichment, I would just pay attention. If you're getting, you know, days upon days of negatives, give that bird something it likes. <laughs> it's true. And I, you know, I think too, it, it kind of keeps you honest that you're like, oh no, he didn't like, and this also will hopefully help with I put it in and I left it for a second and he didn't like it. So I took it out and I threw it away or, you know, I, I, I just, I, he's not, he doesn't, he's not going to get that again because he didn't like it. We'll give it a chance and you can record what the initial behavior was. But then I also have on the, the form observed uh, behavior observed following that interaction. And so what happens afterwards? Is it the initial, your initial response is, oh, no, 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 this is not something that should be in my cage. And then, you know, a couple hours later, it's like, oh, I might go tap on that or I might, you know, um, interact with it a little bit. And then after the interaction is complete, I think it's really important. This is especially important if you've got animals that are housed together. And I'm sure you see this at the farm, Jack. You don't want to put in, in, in any enrichment that will cause aggressive behavior between animals. So you want to, you know, if you offer something and then you take it away and suddenly everyone in the aviary is completely up in arms and just it's crazy time, you might not want to offer that again. So it's important to look at the before, during, and after when you're offering enrichment and record it. So because you guys are amazing companion parrot owners. And just from the things that you tell us every single week, we know that, but sometimes we're not completely honest with ourselves. We're like, oh yeah, he loves that. I know he does. And well, how do you know that? What's telling you that? And so having those records will help with that. Um, and I, I mean, we mentioned it earlier, but again, so what Robin was saying about, you know, paying attention to things that might cause that aggressive response, things that might, um, a lot of people inadvertently enrich their animals with uh, what the animal sees as a nesting cavity and then encourage a hormonal response because, um, you know, you gave it a nest box. 
Um, you gave it a nest box and you bring it food every day. And, um, you know, may, maybe you're also, you know, petting the bird in a way you shouldn't be petting it. Well, all of a sudden you, uh, you know, you, you took it to dinner and a movie and you, you brought it home. It, it's going to have expectations. Um, so just pay attention to the things that you are offering. Um, and any enrichment, no matter what it is, no matter how many times you have given it, should always be assessed for safety as your animal is interacting with it. And I would say paying attention to those things, that aggressive response, that hormonal response, those are going to be part of that safety assessment. Absolutely. So I think, you know, just to kind of close up a little bit, keeping the records really, to me, is a way to, to follow through with that animal welfare that we keep talking about to make sure that you are providing the best welfare that you can for an animal that's in human care. And, you know, that sounds super clinical, but it's really about, you guys want to do what's right. You want to do the best that you can for your birds. And so by keeping these records, which I've got to be honest, this was not, I wasn't like super excited to, uh, to do this um, tonight. But um, it's important. It's really important. And I mean, what do you think, Jack? Well, so I'm weird. So you can't ask me that. Because um, Justin actually makes fun of me because whenever we have friends who they're getting a new new animal, setting up records for them and teaching them how to keep records for them. For me, that actually is fun. I like keeping records on my animals. Um, because again, it ties into that it helps you to provide the best possible care for your animals. When you're keeping those records, it's going to help you avoid problems before they can become problems. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the more you're willing to do on that, the more you can collect and assess, um, the, the better off you're going to be. Um, but it's also, you know, don't, don't beat yourself up over it. Don't run, you know, you don't need to get a weight on your bird every 27 minutes. Um, you know, you don't need to be taking a magnifying glass and looking at the bottoms of their feet three times a day. Um, you know, use your common sense here. Use your best judgment. Anything that seems weird, off, or different to you, I would note. Um, because again, you're watching your bird. You are going to be the best expert on what is normal for your bird. So if you see that change, I would say it's worth noting. So we're going to put some resources up for you guys um, at the leatherelves.net and we will, um, I know that, that Nick put in the comments, uh, there's also a great, uh, some great charts at Hari Hagen Avicultural Research Institute. They have some really cool templates um, for keeping uh, weight records and things like that on your birds. So those are available as well. But um, so we're going to get that up for you. And we did have some videos that we were going to show you guys tonight, but I think we we can do that another night. Maybe we've got we're, we're kind of long on time here, but um, <laughs> and, and I'll talk to Nick and see how we can make this happen and maybe put them on the site or something like that. Um, it's it was just to give you guys an opportunity to assess um, enrichment and see what you how, what you guys came up with and and you know, using the, the guidelines that we gave you, but we can, we can work that in at some other point, I think. So we do have a trivia question, um, tonight. What's the most important thing to do with animal records? So, hmm, there's a lot of important things to do but there's one that's the most important thing to do. And we did mention it several times and it does apply to both your medical and your enrichment records. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. So if you guys will put in your comments, um, the good news is we do have Nick who's going to be able to analyze the timestamp. So for Robert and I, it's very, very fun because we have no responsibility <laughs> on who the winner is. <laughs> And 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 then we just you know throw Nick under the bus, which we probably shouldn't do because he makes us look good every week. But uh, right, so 
All right. Julie Soskin, make them accessible and look at them, the data. Absolutely, Julie. That was what we were going for was the data. Um, so if you just keep it, it's not going to do you any good. And um, Julie, I will send you a message um, and we'll we'll talk about, uh, I think the prize this week would be, will be um, a Leather Elves toy. So if uh, I will get in touch with you, Julie, and we'll, we'll see what works for you. We don't want you to fall into a favorites trap. And I know that you um, do use leather elves toys. So we'll, we'll be careful with that, but uh, you know, we, I'll as get together with you. Assess it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. As long, if you don't assess it, I'm not sending it. Wow. That's kind of punishing. Um, no, but yeah, assessment is so very important and keeping these records. It, it really is. Um, so any reminders, Jack, before we, we go. Well, I know that you have a sale going on right now. Um, Nick Thank very you. conveniently puts the information up on the screen to make it easy for us to follow. Um, so if you go to the Leather Elves store, um, you guys can just go to the leatherelves.net and you'll see the link for the store. I believe it's right up at the top. Um, and you can use that coupon code that is on your, yes, the coupon code is on your screen. Um, and you can get some really cool toys as well. Um, if you guys have not yet already, we encourage you to like the Leather Elves on Facebook. That's going to give you notifications whenever we start a live stream. Uh, subscribe to the High Red Bird YouTube channel because all of our live streams are in a playlist over there as well. Um, we're closing in on 40 hours of content on that playlist, which is a little bit alarming. Um, it doesn't feel like we've been... Actually, no, no, it does. It does. <laughs> um, but it's definitely worth it. Thank you guys so much because you're always so engaged, um, always so interested in all the things that Robin and I, you know, get on to talk about, things that we've experienced in our careers. And for us, it's it makes it so worth it because it means that there are so many people that are interested in doing things that they maybe didn't think of in order to provide the best possible care for their animals. Um, and to me, that's incredible. Uh, yeah, it's, it really does. You know, there, there are a lot of reinforcers that are built into this for us. And it's the, but the biggest one is you guys, you know, coming back and saying, Oh, I tried this and it worked or someone messaging me and saying, you know, what you talked about Friday night really made me start thinking. And I think that's, what you know why we do what we do so thank you again you guys and and bring your friends every friday night next week we are going to be busting some common parrot myths you guys asked for myth busters and that's what we're going to do um we're going to kind of see if we can come up with some answers to those those age old myths that a lot of us have lived by for a very long time so you guys have a great weekend and a great week. Um, if you're in where there's so much of the country that's so hot right now, um, just stay cool. And I want to wish all you bird dads and, you know, dad dads, human dads um, and, and moms who act like dads. Um, so anybody, you know, out there who's celebrating Father's Day, we wanted to, you know, tell you happy Father's Day and have a wonderful week. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.